All right, NYB community, we are back. Episode 177 of the Minding Your Business podcast. I'm your host, Champ Ron. Entrepreneurship, real estate, trending news. There's no business like minding your own. Thank you so much for coming back. Subscribe to the podcast, five star, five star, wherever you get your podcast, certainly on Apple and wherever. Uh, that way we can continue to grow our, our audience and you can go to the mybpodcast.com to connect with us, uh, connect with our online directory and get more exclusive content uh, around the Minding Your Business podcast and the Minding Your Business community. Hope again, you are enjoying great times uh, today. We're in uh, still unprecedented times uh, as it relates to uh, the world that we live in right now. But just know that um, we all have three things in common. We all want to be better for ourselves, better for our families and better for our communities. And so keep that in mind as we all interact. Listen, excited about today's guest. Uh, Jerry Detweiler is the educational director of NAV. Uh, you can go to nav.com. That's NAV.com. You can see all her great content. And listen, this is someone in MYB community. She's been some of everywhere. I mean, she has been on the Today Show website. She's been on NBC News, CBS, just about any, you know, uh, mainstream media uh, she's been connected to. And, and, you know, she's dedicated her career um, to helping you know, business owners and helping people have better um, grasp of their financial picture um, and better grasp of credit strategy, um, which is very important. Um, whether you, it's not just about borrowing money from institutions, but it's about ensuring that you've got the, the proper strategy and that you're managing funds and money correctly and managing those profiles uh, to maximize uh, what your, you know, your goals that you're attempting to reach. And so, Jerry, thank you so much for taking time out uh, to be on the Money Your Business podcast. Oh, it's truly my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're definitely glad to have you. And yeah, let's jump in because um, before we get into some of the discussion around credit and that sort of thing, because um, I want to make sure to give you an opportunity to kind of paint a really good picture for that for our audience. But just tell us a little bit about you. Who is Jerry and how did you get to where you are today? You know, I've been in this uh, field of credit and uh, financial education for a long, long time. Yeah. I wrote the first uh, mass market book back in the day that talked about FICO scores. So, oh, wow. and uh, and when I started, you actually had to go to the credit bureau to get your credit report. You didn't get it online for free. So, so it's been quite <laughs> the evolution. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I really enjoy being an advocate. I love digging in and, you know, helping people find answers um, to their credit questions. And a few years ago, I shifted more towards small business with my book, Finance Your Own Business. And while yeah. I was researching that book, I ended up interviewing the CEO of NAV. Um, and little did I know, when the book came out, I thought he might like to buy some books and I ended up working, ended up working there full time. So yeah. I've been focused on uh, primarily small business for the past five years, but you know, small business owners are consumers too. So uh, it, you need both to really be successful. Yep, absolutely, Jerry. And so, you know, what, as we transition, so, you know, obviously we have the worldwide pandemic going on right now in terms of, uh, you know, COVID-19, the coronavirus. Um, and I talk to small business owners all the time. And of course, you know, one of the things that's top of their mind is, um, you know, being able to sustain themselves, right? Um, as you've had, you know, particular impacts to the market. And so what are some of the things that you're seeing kind of in the credit space, particularly with business credit, um, you know, kind of pre-pandemic and then coming now as we're going through it? Yeah, well, I would say we entered, you know, 2020 just roaring. Um, so many different lending options, uh, right. over 44 different types of financing for small businesses, over 6,000 lenders targeting small businesses. And then mm, second, third week in March, it was like someone hit the brakes, you know, and yeah. lenders just said, this is too risky. We need to stop pause, figure out what we're doing. And a lot of them did. Um, yeah. Some lenders will not return. But for the most part, what they're starting to tell us, you know, we got through this wave of PPP and we can certainly talk about that. And now, you know, there may be additional relief for some small businesses, but what lenders are trying to do now is start to dip their toes back in the water, right? Because they don't make money right. unless they lend money. So exactly. So they're trying to look at how can we do it in um, in a responsible way, you know, for sure. our investors, our shareholders, for our financial institutions. And a lot of what we'll see 
first stage will be very revenue based financing. So companies, some companies are doing well. Some companies are making more money than they did last year this time. That's true. Um, and for those, the revenues can help demonstrate to the lender, hey, you know, it's well, it's you're able to take a risk. Um, but I do think standards are tightening. So I've always talked about having good credit, about having strong revenues, about having your finances in order, and those kinds of things are more important than ever. Yeah, definitely. And so, you know, as you kind of paint that current picture, you know, kind of for us, Jerry, let, let's kind of walk through some of the steps of credit, because obviously we all kind of start with our personal credit, right? Um, here in Memphis, you know, we have, you know, challenges with that in, in our community. We have, um, you know, pretty, you know, kind of widespread in general credit challenges historically um, on with personal credit, I'm referring to. Um you know, what are some things you're seeing on the personal credit side and how can we all best protect and manage our personal credit scores? Obviously, you know, the, the, the first obvious piece is obviously, you know, whatever debts you have or um, that you're servicing, you've got to be able to pay that and make the payment on time. Yeah, I think most would understand that that's roughly about 35 percent of the makeup of your score. But, you know, obviously, this easier said than done, <laughs> you know, of course, uh, depending on situations. But, you know, kind of talk through that personal credit piece and what are some ways that we can all be better in, in that space to start? And then we'll get to kind of business credit some more. Sure. So as you mentioned, payment payment history is the most important factor on your personal credit score, also on business credit as well. And yeah. um, the, the the number one thing you want to try to do, if at all possible, is make the minimum payment on time. Sure. Because even if you start to carry debt, that may start to impact your scores. And there are some things that business owners could, we can talk about, they can consider. But uh, is, is if you start to accumulate debt, especially on things like credit cards, where you have revolving credit where you can borrow and then pay back and borrow again, that can impact your score, but you can recover from that very quickly. It's harder to recover from a late payment. So, yeah. you know, once the late payment is on your credit, it's on there for seven years, it does have less impact over time. So I do want to reassure those who might be going through very difficult times right now, you know, you will be able to rebuild your credit at, at sure. the other side of this. I understand it's not easy at all. And it's very, it can be very terrifying. The one thing I would really encourage everyone to think about is to um, take advantage of opportunities to defer payments on loans. Yes, so a absolutely. number of lenders are offering these payment deferments and that can avoid a late payment on your credit report. It will cost you more because interest will continue to accumulate, right? Then it costs you more than if you had say paid off that credit card or made that payment on that car loan if they just tack it on to the end, but it preserves cash flow. And I do think cash flow is really important right now in today's environment because we just don't know how long you know, how long things will take to start to yeah. turn around. We don't know if there'll be a second dip in the fall. So you really want to preserve cash flow. So if you haven't investigated those options, I would encourage you to do so, to reach out to your lenders. Sometimes it's hard to get through to them, but be persistent. Start with their websites if you can, if you can get online and do it that way. And yes. see what you can do to defer those payments. And then just make sure that you set a reminder, you know, on your phone or your calendar or whatever you need to do so that when you need to start making the payment again, you don't forget and you don't end up with an inadvertent late payment because you had kind of forgotten about it because it hasn't been in your normal, you know, bill paying for the past couple of months. Right, exactly. And I went through that just with my uh, insurance. Uh, matter of fact, just last week, um, I did a deferment on my uh, auto insurance. Um, just as this thing was starting and again, not really knowing what cash flow was going to look like. Right, Jerry. And so, yeah. um, you know, I and I made like incremental payments because I had them set on auto draft. So what happens is when I called and kind of put them more on that kind of deferment or kind of arrangement, it canceled the auto draft. And so I wasn't paying attention to it. And, you know, a couple months go by and then I get a phone call. They're like, hey, Ron, you, you know, you got a balance here on your insurance. It's like, what? Why? You know, you, you guys draft it every month. It's like, well, no, remember when you did this, you know, it, it took it off. So I was like, oh, okay, you guys, I have to call to tell you to put it back on. Okay, makes sense. So I made the payment rather sizable than what I was used to. But, you know, I made the payment so I could stay in, obviously, in good graces. So um, to that point, I just experienced that, uh, Jerry, with, again, that uh, with State Farm. So shout out to State Farm um, for being uh, supportive of me with that. So, um, one of the things that I hear from with business owners and people, Jerry, and I wanted to get your, your thoughts on this is um, if they don't have 
kind of long standing or, or big credit profiles, or maybe they don't have a, a, a big mix of credit, right? Maybe they got a student loan, maybe a car note, something like that, but they don't have all these things like lines of credit and HELOCs and mortgages and that sort of thing. And what they're telling me is that lenders are dinging them, even if they got fairly good credit, they're dinging them for not having the proper mix. They're, or they're saying, hey, you know, we'll lower the rate or improve your uh, approval terms, you know, if you had a better mix of credit. I didn't hear that quite as much um, during my banking time, you know, in terms of working with credit really closely. Is that something that's fairly newer or has that always kind of been the case that, you know, that whole notion of, you know, yes, you have good credit, you have a good credit score, but maybe you don't have the longstanding history or you don't have the diversity of credit products to your history. Yeah, well, actually, I would say it's, gosh, it must have been 15 years ago. I didn't get the best rate on my homeowner's insurance when I bought a house because of my credit mix. And yeah. uh, I, at that time, I had a car that was paid for in cash. And I didn't, I just taken out the mortgage. So it hadn't started reporting yet. So I, so the mix, when you're talking about mix, what you're talking about is a mix between installment accounts. Those are things like yeah. mortgages and car loans and student loans, things where you make a fixed monthly payment each month for a fixed period of time versus revolving, which is like your credit card where you pay depending on how much you borrowed against that credit card. And yeah. consumers with the best scores um, tend to have a mix of different types of accounts. So this can affect you at any age, whether you're young, whether you're older. My dad had the same thing. He didn't get the best rate on his auto insurance because of his credit. Not It wasn't bad. He just didn't have much you know, credit reporting. So yeah. one thing that's happened in the past few years is there are some new products that I really like that can be beneficial um, in this type of reporting situation. And they're called credit builder accounts. And okay. they've been around for a while. Some credit unions, some community banks offer them. But basically what you do is you borrow a savings account. So like you borrow a, a certificate a certificate of a deposit, say for $1,000. Sure. But you don't get that money right away. You make monthly payments, and then once you've paid it off, paid for it, then you get the money in that savings account. And the new ones will report that each month as an installment account payment to your credit reports. Sure. So if you're not someone who has a car loan or a mortgage or a student loan, this could be a way to diversify you know, your credit history and uh, it's it's fairly inexpensive. And um, there's a couple of online lenders doing that. Um, Deserve and um, Self, Self used to be Self Lender. They both offer yeah. online credit bureau, uh, credit builder accounts. Yeah. And, and you know, I'll, I'll say this too, Jerry, because some of the pushback that people will give, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this too, is it, why am I, I, they feel like they're being dinged for being responsible, right? They're saying, well, I didn't take out all that kind of stuff because I either I couldn't afford it or I was managing my credit based on what I need, not to just go get things just for the sake of getting them, if that makes sense. So yeah. can you kind of speak to that, that, you know, there, there are some folks that were upset because they say, well, Ron, you know, I didn't just go get a mortgage just because, you know, I, didn't get one, you know, right? I, I just wasn't in that position. So I don't have all these different, like you say, you know, revolving versus installment products. And so they, in their mind, they just felt like they were being a responsible borrower. Um, yes, I, I think that's a very that? fair concern. And we do know that, you know, there are some issues with um, how credit scores um, translate to certain communities in the United States who may right. not you know, as use as much credit or may not have a tradition of using as much credit and maybe paying cash for things because things like your prepaid, you know, your debit card doesn't report to your credit. So right. you don't get any credit for being responsible and, you know, swiping a debit card and paying for that purchase right away. But one of the challenges is the credit bureaus don't collect banking information. So they don't know, you know, whether they don't know what else you're doing besides the things that show up on your credit report. So right. the only thing they can go from, the only thing they can analyze is what's on your credit report. So we are seeing a couple of new, you know, new products that are being introduced. Experian has Experian Boost, which can look at certain bills that don't traditionally appear on your credit, cell phone bills and utility bills, for example. Um, Ultra mm -hmm. FICO is a new score that they're, it's still very much in test mode, but it would look at how you've managed your bank account. 
to see if you can get credit for that. Um, there's some other companies like Bloom that are doing some interesting things with your financial accounts and blockchain. So we'll see changes, right? We will right. see this change. It is I, absolutely. And if you and I, Ron, get back on, you know, on this in a year or two years or five years, we'll see new products out there. But right yeah. now we're dealing with the system that we have. Right. Yeah, and the system exactly. we have has been around for a long time and it judges you based on the bills that you pay. And so you want accounts that report. So one thing I do like about something like a um, like a credit builder account is the fact that you're also building savings. So at least when yeah. you get done, you have something to show for it. You know, you right. have a savings account. It's not a car that maybe you can't drive anymore because it's not that great. It's, yeah, or, yeah, right. You know, exactly. whatever. <laughs> so it's an appreciating right. asset that you're financing. So that could be a really good thing. Yep, definitely. And so, you know, comparing personal and business credit, right? Um, Jerry, you know, so let, let's transition this conversation into kind of comparing, you know, then personal credit to business credit. All right. So compare and contrast the two. And then how do people establish business credit? Okay, great question. So business credit is similar to personal credit in that there are these credit bureaus that collect information about how businesses pay their bills. And then they sell those credit reports, you know, to insurance companies and lenders and anybody else who wants to purchase one. Because with business credit, there's no regulation. So there is no restriction on who can check your report like there is with personal. There's no requirement that they give you a free annual credit report. There's no requirement in terms of how disputes are resolved or anything like that. It's, it's pretty much unregulated, even though it's been around for a long, long time. Yeah, I was going to so, say, it's been around forever. So, oh, yeah. Donna Bradstreet. Yeah, I was going to say, Bradstreet they've been around a million years. in the 1850s, and right. Abraham Lincoln worked for um, Dun yeah, & Bradstreet. Was, that's right, exactly. Back in the day. So yeah, wasn't that, he like a, um, he was some kind of administrator or something like that? He's a reporter. Them? He's a reporter. reporter. Yep. Yeah. Gathered the information. I don't know if he sent it by telegraph or what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Pony Express probably. <laughs> Pony Express, and then uh, that was right. information they used. So these have been around for a long time. They're you know they're very well established, but because there's no regulation, there's not a lot of transparency. So yeah, that's one reason NAV is around is to bring that transparency. We're the only place you can see your business credit from Dun & Bradstreet, Equifax, and Experian for free, updated every month. So it's very much like Credit Karma, but for small business. There you go. And then we also show personal credit because re in reality, you got to work on both, right? You, you right. A strong business. You came from a banking background. You know, bankers exactly. want to see that personal credit. And they want to see it from all... Any owner in the business who owns 20% or more of the business, they're probably going to check their personal credit. So if you have a business partner and they don't have good credit, that could impact you. Something you yeah. need to be aware of. Um, but you can start building business credit, even if your personal credit isn't very strong. And we have some really simple strategies for doing that at NAV. Sure. Absolutely. And so then, Jerry, are people, you know, let's just say they get into a pickle with their business credit, right? Because here's one of the fallacies that I, I come to find out is, you know, obviously, it, and it, it's part of the nature of it. Like you talked about the unregulated pieces of business credit. People think of business credit as do whatever I want. You know, there, there's not the same impact that I have on my personal credit, right? So I put it under the business. So if I can't pay it or something happens, it won't affect me personally. I can just... Um, divest the business and then go open another one. Right. <laughs> you know, and so that's the, you know, the, I think that's a lot of the mindset that people tend to have. If, if people do do that, right. And they have, um, you know, kind of negative items on their business credit report. Um, is you, are you and your company able to help with restoring that? Uh, and what are some of the ways that people can restore their business credit uh, if they happen to get into, um, you know, a pickle with it? Yeah. So let me just touch on two things there because you bring up some really, something really important. It's the reason I wrote Finance Your Own Business. I wrote it with yes. um, Garrett Sutton, who's a small business attorney, and he's on Robert, Kiyosaki, Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad team. And he had yeah. so many clients who were paying thousands of dollars for these business credit building programs that said, hey, we'll get you all this business credit with no personal guarantees. So basics basically sounded like free money, right? Like, right. Get free money. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not opposed. There are some that you know do a good job of helping a business owner who might feel overwhelmed or lost in the process. But you have to be very careful about the promises. Most lenders are going to want a personal guarantee yes. of the owner. So even if it's not showing up on your personal credit, if you default, 
they have the right and you can read the loan agreement and it says they have the right to try to go after your personal assets as well. And yes. this is very clear, um, you know, with some of the recent, um, uh, I just just submitted an article that talked about the fact that the EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, they waive the personal guarantee for loans under $200,000. But if you read the agreement, it sure sounds like they have a personal guarantee. Yeah, um, it has so, a personal guarantee. I'll tell you that. Yeah, so you have to be really, really careful about that. So that's one aspect that, you know, just understand that you're probably going to sign a personal guarantee. So that means you're still responsible. The second thing is the business credit bureaus actually do a really good job usually of, sometimes it's too good, of associating a previous business with the an owner's current business. And so mm -hmm. sometimes that can come back to bite you. I'll give you a really quick story. Um, NAV's co-founder, uh, Levi King, he uh, had a sign manufacturing business and he bought the physical aspect assets of a sign manufacturing business that had gone out of business. The son had taken it over after dad retired. He kind of run it in the ground. The business credit wasn't good. And he bought all the equipment of that business, but he didn't buy the business itself. Well, okay. Dun & Bradstreet linked that business credit profile to his business credit because they linked wow. the name of that purchase. And he ended up with bad business credit, cost him a big um, job that he was bidding on. And then he had ended up having to straighten it out. So don't assume that, hey, I'm just going to take a shot at this. If it doesn't work out, I'm not going to suffer any repercussions. You know, it is, it is possible. But having yeah. said that, if you do end up in a situation where your business credit isn't great, there are steps you can take. We're not a credit repair firm, but we'll give you the free access, free information and free tools. And we do have a phone team for support to help you. So if you need to file a dispute, for example, or you want to see, okay, what are the steps I need to do to start building good business credit? Then we help with that for free. And that's included on our, our free plans as well as any paid NAV plans. Yeah, definitely. But that's good to know because, you know, again, people, again, they, you know, th people pick up notions and things like that and kind of run with them sometimes without really uh, understanding them or really vetting them out. And so um, with an individual, say, judgment that may show up on a, a business credit report or a personal credit report, do they kind of function the same way in terms of how they reflect and the impact? that they have, you know, so like an individual judgment or an individual mispayment ding, do the, yeah, between the two so, report reports, are they f fairly similar? Yeah, judgments are interesting because a few years ago, there was a settlement between the state's attorneys generals and the credit bureaus that basically resulted in them removing most personal credit judgments and most personal tax liens from credit reports. And the problem was that this information was being collected and reported from the courthouse level. And mm -hmm. it's a patchwork all across the country, you know, how they report it. And, right. and so if you had that on your credit report and it wasn't yours or it wasn't accurate or it wasn't up to date, it was very, very difficult to get that fixed. And so now your personal credit report probably no longer lists a court judgment or a tax lien. It probably still does list any bankruptcies within the applicable time period because sure. um, bankruptcies are very are verifiable through the PACER system. So they're a little bit different. On the yeah, yeah the business side, um, judgments, tax liens, uh, collection accounts, bankruptcies, all may appear. It Business credit is not as consistent. So you may see something show up on your report with Equifax, for example, but not with DMB or with Experian and not with the other two. It's not at all the same consistency. And I recently did some research, you know, you can pull business credit reports for any business. There's no legal restrictions. So I went into sure. my NAP account and I pulled it for a business I knew had filed for bankruptcy. And one of the bureaus reported no bankruptcies, one reported three and one reported five. So, you know, the, the information can, can vary significantly, but I'll add one more tip on that. And that is on the business side, there's mm -hmm. no legal limit for how long they can report negative information. So it varies mm -hmm. dramatically from bureau to bureau. So just understand that there's no seven years or there's no 10 years in the case of bankruptcy. It really is up to the bureau how long they want to report that information. And that's for a business credit. So if a business that's files correct. a, a chapter 11 uh, bankruptcy, you know, there's no set time limit. Like on the personal side, if you file a chapter seven or 13, you know, they have finite dates for which they are you know, removed. Wow. Yes. Yeah. 
so so that's just determined, I guess, in in court, I guess, or, or is that not determined it's at all? Their, it's really their choice how long they want to keep reporting it. Now, one of the things I'll give you a tip for when you check your business credit, it's not going to be the same experience as personal credit. So if you you know get a free nap count and you check your credit, you're going to be surprised. And right. one of the things you're going to be surprised by is the fact that your creditors don't report. It doesn't show the name of your creditors. So you get a car loan, a personal car loan, you know, you get it from Wells Fargo or your local credit union. It tells you that's where you got the car loan from. Um, if you have a car loan reported on business credit, it's just going to say auto. It yeah. won't say the name of the lender. So you have to be a little bit of a detective if you have a lot of accounts sure. um, to figure out who's reporting and who's not. Things like it might say bank card instead of the name of your credit card issuer. So it's a little bit different in that way as well. Yeah, definitely. Our guest today, Jerry Detwaller, uh, educational director, education director for NAV. Uh, that is NAV.com. Jerry, um, you, you mentioned bankruptcy. I want to ask you some about you know, that because yeah, you know, I've come across it. I talked about, you know, with you know, certainly here in Memphis, I know Salt Lake City, Utah, there's some areas that have had um kind of known credit challenges over the years. Um, you know, bankruptcy is is one of those. Can you talk about chapter seven and chapter thirteen bankruptcy from the credit standpoint in terms of um, you know, uh, you know, how to utilize them if you should utilize them and kind of win and then, you know, what that impact has on, on your credit, because you know, I've come across numerous people, you know, Jerry, who have, you know, some are, are, you know, they hate it. They're scared to death. It has a stigma. I've had other customers where, I, especially when I was in the small business area that used it as a tool <laughs> um, and, you know, everything all around. And so what's the impact of bankruptcy and, and when should a person really consider filing? Yeah, I, I suspect, Ron, we're going to see, a, a, we know we're going to see an increase of bankruptcies due to the coronavirus economic crisis. I mean, that's just a reality. And right. you know, the, the one thing I want to say is it's not, don't, you don't, if, if you're, if you're doing your best you can, if you're doing the best you can, that it's not a moral failing, right? It is a restructuring or, you know, a, a plan to give someone a fresh start. Um, there is a new uh, type of small business bankruptcy called Chapter 11, Subchapter 5. Yeah. And traditionally, Chapter 11 has been pretty time consuming, pretty expensive. And this allows um, businesses to reorganize a little bit less expensively and still stay in business. And interestingly, that I think was enacted in February. So it was pre-COVID. It had been in the works for a while. So it's kind of interesting yeah. that it just the timing turned out to be sort of, you know, prescient for, for what what's going on in these times. On the personal side, you know, most people either file chapter seven or chapter 13. Chapter seven is this, what's called the straight bankruptcy. That's where you wipe out most of your debts, sometimes all of them, but at least most of them. Um, contrary to popular belief, it is possible to discharge student loans in bankruptcy. You just, um, it's more involved, but sure. it, there is, it is a possibility for you know certain borrowers. And then chapter 13 is where you go into a repayment plan and you pay back a portion of your debts, sometimes all of them, but a portion of your debts over five years. And usually the reason someone will choose chapter 13 is because either they don't you know meet the means test for chapter seven, so they can't file it, or there's assets that they want to keep that they would lose if they file you know, right. on chapter seven. And so things that they would have to give up. So maybe they want to stay in their house and there's not a, like in Florida, we have a homestead exemption for your entire property, but that's not true in all states. So, right. so here's what I say. And so the impact to your credit is severe, right? You're going to see it drop significantly, but a lot of times, by the time someone gets to bankruptcy, they've already missed payments. They might have accounts that are in collections. They it's might already have already down low. Charged yeah. off. So there's already a lot of damage done, right? So sometimes it's just the time to take that step, get the get the collection calls to stop, regroup, and then you know move on. So what I tell consumers is you can rebuild your credit after bankruptcy. I'm not going to say it's going to be the easiest and pleasant, most pleasant thing. Um, people can ask about a bankruptcy forever. So mm -hmm. you know you could fill out an application for a background check in 20 years. And they could ask if you ever filed for bankruptcy and you truthfully have to answer yes. Even if it's not in your credit report, it's still available in the public record. So you right. need to understand that. But if you're having trouble, really having serious trouble paying it by your bill, paying your bills, here's my suggestion. You make three calls. One is to a nonprofit credit counseling agency 
and they're going to talk to you about what your options are for paying certain debts, especially things like credit cards and student loans. Sure. The second consultation is, um, and if you can get on a payment plan with them, great. That's the least impact to your credit. The second call is to someone who does debt negotiation and debt settlement in a reputable way. So these sure. are the folks that help you negotiate to pay off what you can and then a, a, a get an agreement with the collection agency to, to eliminate the rest. And the third is your bankruptcy attorney. And bankruptcy gives you the legal protection that the other two don't. So you so if you talk to all three, then you have a sense of, okay, here's my options and here's and I think with a bankruptcy attorney, the number one thing they can do is answer those questions that are keeping you up in the middle of the night, you know, yes. 2 a.m. Yep, you're awake and you're like, you know, what are they going to do to me? Am I going to lose my house? Am I going to lose my car? Right. Am I going to lose my job? They can answer those kinds of questions for you. They can stop wage garnishment, you know, things that are really important that are very financially stressful. So don't sure. put off at least talking to them and finding out. I'm not saying bankruptcy is the right choice for everyone. But I'm saying being informed and understanding your options and then making an informed decision is something that I do suggest. Yep, definitely. And, you know, part of you know the conversation, obviously, with bankruptcy is debt, you know, that you and I have been talking about kind of through this whole interview, Jerry, is, you know, just managing debt, period. Right. Um, and, and you mentioned earlier that obviously during this pandemic, you know, many you know have been and will continue to be impacted um, by the, the downturn economically. Uh, as we look holistically around the country and around the world, um, you know, how should, you know, I guess people and business owners for that matter, you know, manage debt, you know, so if you, you know, you came into this and you've got, you know, maybe you've got more debt than you intended, or you're just, you know, servicing the debt that you currently have, you know, Jerry, what are some good practices for people, um, you know, to manage that debt so they can avoid, you know, getting to the point of, you know, having to consider thing, you know, those options that you mentioned. Yeah. Well, certainly talking to your, if you're on your, on the business side, talking to your suppliers and vendors and seeing whether you can improve the terms that you have with them. So maybe you have net 30 terms right now, which means you have to pay them in full in 30 days. Maybe you can get net 60 terms. Um, you know, those, those companies that are supplying essential services or goods to your to your business, they want you to stay in business, right? They don't want you to right. go out of business because then they <laughs> right. know they won't get paid and then you won't be a future customer. Um, right. But at the same time, they want to hear from you. So if you are in a cash crunch and you're having trouble making those payments, you want to be in touch with them and let them know what's going on and see what you can work out. And then like in your situation with your insurance, if you do work it out with them, a different repayment schedule, ask them to make sure that's reflected if it's reported to the credit bureaus, right? right. So that if you change it from net 30 to net 60 and you pay on, you know, day 59, you don't want it to show up as a late payment because they still right. have net 30 in their system, right? So you want to make sure that that is covered as well. And so just like with the personal where I suggested if you need to take advantage of deferments or, you know, on your payments for a little while to improve cash flow, same thing with your business. And then the other thing I know a lot of businesses are doing there is really, really scrutinizing their expenses to see, you know, what's absolutely essential right now. What, you know, might I be able to cut back on and, you know, what might I be able to drop and, and do without for the time being until I can get my business more on solid footing. Yeah, definitely. No, definitely great, uh, great points and great advice uh, for all of us to consider. And matter of fact, now you remind me, I do need, uh, I, I owe State Farm a call for just to make sure that there was no issues with that from our credit. Uh, no one mentioned anything and I haven't seen anything pop up. But like you said, I don't want that nice surprise in 30 days. Um, if something had went past and they didn't change it in the system. So that's actually a good reminder for myself to to make that phone call, Jerry. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely. Um, let's talk about for you for a second. Um, you know, as education director there with NAV, tell us about your role, um, kind of what you're doing day to day to to help people, you know, in, in all these arenas that we're talking about. Well, I, as education director, I do a lot of um, education and outreach. I write for the NAV blog. I write for outside sites like allbusiness.com, where it syndicates to Forbes, Home Business Magazine, and other publications. Um, I also answer a lot of questions. We get a lot of questions on our blog. I'm, I'm behind right now. We've gotten so many questions in the past couple of months. Um, right. But I answer a lot of questions and then uh, speak at conferences. I train small business advisors on business and personal credit and financing options. Uh, and so so, you know, I have a pretty diverse plate, which I, 
I really love. But the past couple of months, we've been really focused on educating business owners about the Paycheck Protection Program or PPP loans and the yeah. Economic Injury Disaster Loans or EIDL loans. We've written over 50 articles on those topics and then and then tried to update them every time they came out with new <laughs> new guidance and new rules. So it's been an adventure the past couple of months. But, you know, hopefully we've helped a few people um, figure out that interim financing so they can keep their business going, maybe, you know, retool, pivot, whatever you want to call it, and find a way to to transition to the new economic reality that we're facing. Yeah, definitely. And, and Jerry, what, what's something we should know about PPP lending? Obviously, that's a, a huge you know, a thing going around. It's a huge buzz. Um, you know, I know some businesses that have been able to get theirs. I know others that have experienced a lot of frustration. Um, I, I've talked to several bank you know, C-suite folks that have, you know, whatever hair they had remaining is all gone now because they've pulled it all out, having to deal between, you know, obviously with the SBA and, and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, what's something we should know about the PPP loan program that maybe we don't, or maybe something that surprised you during the process? Yeah, well, first of all, there are still funds available until August 8. And you're right, many lenders have stopped making PPP loans, but there are lenders out there still making them. So, and we continue at NAB to match borrowers to PPP loans. That's at no charge. You can just go to our site, you'll see a link and click on there and you can still try to get PPP. Even if yeah. you returned your first or declined your first PPP or even returned it, you can go back and get it in this, you know, continuing round until August 8. So, one thing just to, I, I can't make any promises, but I, 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 I think there's a very strong leaning in Congress to forgive PPP loans of $150,000 or less automatically. So you yeah. won't have to, the application, quite frankly, is terrifying. <laughs> I've been <laughs> through it because I've had to write about it. And right. uh, yeah, it's, it's like, it's like tax time, you know, uh, all over again, right. All over again. Yeah, it's not fun. <laughs> but um, although it's, you know, it's doable, but it's it's definitely not fun. But that would cover about 80% of PPP loans. So if that happens, and I, I, I'm i keeping my fingers crossed, but I'm, I'm optimistic, then that I think that would reduce uh, and take a big burden off of business owners. Just make sure you really can justify that your business needs the money, you know, that you've been impacted. Um, that is important. We are start seeing more and more cases of outright fraud where people got these loans and then tried to leave the country or, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. And that's not good. That's criminal. You can you know end up in big trouble. But um, right. but if you're operating honestly, you can document you're using it for the right purposes, mostly payroll, including yourself. You can pay yourself. Then it can be a real lifesaver for businesses in this very uncertain time. Yeah. No doubt about it. And it, it's helped some businesses. I, I think when, you know, with what the work that I do, one of the things that I'm holding community banks accountable to is making sure that holistically where they do business, that businesses are getting the same access. So, you know, whether it's women owned businesses, whether it's black owned businesses, um, you know, Hispanic owned businesses, Asian owned businesses, that where they do business, that there's a, a equal access and an equal support uh, for people holistically. And so, um, there's some areas that are, are doing well with that and some areas still have some opportunities, some challenges, uh, quite frankly, with doing that. But overall, um, you know, the process has continued to progress and lenders and you know, borrowers, everybody will get more information um, as it continues to go. And then folks like yourself that are out, um, you know, truly educating and, and providing this information so that people can make sound and informed decisions, uh, obviously, is very critical. And so, um, you know, Jerry, as we get to wrap up, um, you know, what are one or two best practices that have helped you in, in, you know, progressing through your career to where you are now and where you see yourself going here in the future? You know, what are one or two things that have really worked for you that you think will work for other people? Um, well, one thing is, I, one thing I talk about is, is um, doing some of the things that you really find hard and dreadful. <laughs> So, so for me, I used to hate public speaking. So I you used to hate public speaking. I was terrible. I mean, we're talking like hide in my room and cry, terrified of public speaking. As and well as you speak. Now really? I do it all the time. And yes. yeah, I got yeah. over it. So here's my tip there. Here's my tip. And I tell this to so many people. <laughs> Join Toastmasters. Now I don't know what yes. Toastmasters is doing right now with yes. virtual, but I'm 
even after I started, and that's not how I got into speaking. I just got forced into it. But yeah. after, even after I was speaking for a few years, I joined my Toastmasters club and it was great. I mean, these people want to support you as you develop your speaking. Yes. The curriculum teaches you how to be a better speaker. It's a fantastic program, inexpensive, highly, highly, highly recommend it. So that's okay. my tip. Okay. And so then, I can back you on that because I'm okay. a member of a great Toastmasters group here, Bluff City Toastmasters. Shout out to them here in Memphis, Tennessee. I joined at the beginning of 2019. Yes. Um, and it has helped me tremendously with public speaking and uh, the support of uh, developing the skill set. Uh, mm. for public speaking. So I, I want to say it cost me 130 bucks for the year. I mean, it was, it, it was not, I mean, it was, it was nothing. Yeah. It, and it was very well worth it. It's a great network. Um, since the downturn, I haven't been able to participate as much. I've just, I've been, you know, tied up in so many different things when they meet, especially at the time that uh, this particular group meets, I'm completely, um, you know, inundated and have some um, professional commitments, but it has been tremendous. So um, NYB community, when Jerry says Toastmasters, trust me, um, Toastmasters will help you uh, with your public speaking, which all of us could uh, always use uh, ongoing coaching and support. And that's the big thing that you get from it is the support, like Jerry mentions, yes. uh, with others that are looking to improve. So it's not just to put you on the spot and make you sweat. It's mm -hmm. designed to get the support because uh, a lot of things you may not notice when you're speaking uh, come out uh, when you're actually up speaking. So, but Jerry, I had to stop right there and, and give the commercial there for you because um, I'm definitely with you. And I think that would help uh, tremendously a lot of people. So, and I can tell because I'm not counting a lot of ums from you. <laughs> oh, and I'm the um king. Let me tell you. Are you? <laughs> I, uh, especially when I first walked in, I was the um king. Uh, I've gotten better. I, I still let some fly. And so I, I, I would continue to work and get better. Uh, and that's why doing this live uh, helps me do that. Right. Because I can always go back and point out you should listen to some of my first few episodes. <laughs> There you go. Well, that's an insider Toastmasters joke. We count ums, but you're doing a fantastic yeah. job, Ron. So <laughs> thanks. <laughs> what else? Um, is there one other thing that you think would work well for others? Yeah, the other thing I would say, I get a lot of questions about this because I'm the co-author or author of five books, is writing a book and publishing a book. And I am a firm believer that you want to publish that book. And yeah. now it's easier than ever to do that. Now, maybe these days it could be a book or a podcast. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. And <laughs> I'm actually doing both. Yeah. Write a book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I but, think you should do both. I, I'm a big advocate of both. Yes, you can. And if you feel like you have a book inside you, find a, again, find a support to get that book out there. Because even if you don't sell a lot of books, the message you can share, the professional credentials that it offers, the doors that it opens. I would not be at NAV today if it weren't for my latest book. And wow. it was because I wrote that book and I interviewed the CEO and then I ended up in this great new phase of my career because of that book. So even if I don't sell a single book, it was worth it to me. So I just right. really, I really support others who want to get that book out and I, I would encourage you to do so. Yep, definitely. I agree with you there. And I put out my book, Legacy Living, uh, actually five years ago now. Wow. That's uh, time's gone by quick, but uh, that's on Amazon. And of course, yours, finance your business, get on the financing fast track uh, that you mentioned earlier. That's available on Amazon as well, correct? It is. And you can actually get a free copy mailed to you if you go to my co author's website, corporatedirect.com, and oh, you wow. sign up for a NAV account through his link. It's free, completely free, and they, we will sure. mail you a copy in the mail. So, corporatedirect.com, you can look for finding your own business, and there's an offer there to, to get both at the same time. Yep, excellent. So, NYB again, uh, great content, free content. Uh, there for you. So I uh, encourage you to go to, um, it's, it, you said it's corporate direct. Yes. Com? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so corporate direct.com go there. NYB uh, sign up for the free nav account. Uh, Cause you need that as well. So those are great resources for you. Two great resources right there uh, for you to take advantage of um, one to be able to help manage your credit profiles. Uh, the other provides great insight from Jerry uh, and her co-author. Uh, for you know a great best-selling book, and so definitely go and support there. Yeah, listen, Jerry, this has been tremendous, very uh, informative. Um, even for someone like me, who's 17, 18 years in the banking industry, it's always good to learn um, 
as much as you can about the credit piece so that we can all continue to be uh, much better uh, in what we do. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Hope to remain connected. Uh, everybody go to nav.com. Make sure that uh, you reach out, connect with Jerry and uh, let her know that you heard her right here on the Mind of Your Business podcast. And Jerry, I'll let you go because you once had a radio show, right? I did. Yes. yes. Three years on the air every week on Mondays. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So any uh, opportunity to get you back in the radio at some point? Or even I'd podcasting? Love do, I'd love to do that again. But right now I'm really enjoying being a guest. It's, it's a little bit less work. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Every side of the microphone is a little different. That's for sure. So no, but Jerry, um, you know, you're, you're great to do this. I know you're extremely busy. There's a ton going on. There's a lot of information, but um, you know, I appreciate you in what you do to provide education and insight, you know, for us all to, again, make better decisions and, and just be a little bit better personally and professionally. And it, it helps us, you know, as we get through these unprecedented, you know, pandemic, uh, times that we're, we're going through. Um, so thank you so much for that and uh, look forward to again, remaining connected and uh, maybe we'll have you back on here soon. And we could talk through some of the updates as they come over the next year, because I know there are going to be plenty of them. There <laughs> so. will be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron. I appreciate what you do too. So it's great to connect with you. Yep. Excellent. Thank you so much. That was our guest, Jerry Detweiler. Uh, education director with NAV. And, you know, I've, I've already noticed this. Now Jerry's got me um, thinking of my Toastmasters because I probably said 10 ums in the last minute after I was doing so well. <laughs> but uh, NYB, thank you all so much for supporting the podcast. Again, go to NAV.com, go to CorporateDirect.com and get the, the resources uh, that you need and that could really help you along your personal and professional walk. Don't forget brandyourpod.com. If you're interested in setting up your own podcast, I had the CRA files launch in the last two weeks. Uh, the downloads are really looking good. <laughs> I'll get updated reports probably on your, the next episode, but that's doing uh, very well. So shout out to the ICBA and uh, their support of the CRA files. I'm working with other individuals on setting up their podcast. So I'm your podcast partner. I will help you through idea generation all the way to launch uh, for your own podcast platform. So go to brandyourpod.com. And don't forget the mybpodcast.com. Go there to get all exclusive insight and information, as well as to listen to any episodes of the Minding Your Business podcast at your leisure. I'm going to get out of here. Thanks again to our guest, Jerry Detweiler. Uh, make sure, again, you connect with her and, and her organization there at NAV, uh, the great team that's helping uh, individuals and small business owners to be just a little bit better uh, with their profiles. I'm Chan Ron. This is the Mind Your Business podcast. Go be great. Thanks again, Jerry. Thank you.